Hello, everyone, and welcome to Party and Friends, the April edition. We're so excited to have you all here and hope you're all doing really well. Uh, before we get started, I, I want to talk briefly about Polka Dot Decoded. Uh, as you know, we've been planning Polka Dot Decoded for the last few months with the different rounds that we've been having between the open call for participation and the voting round. And now we've just announced the agenda that we have through, including 30, 33 community talks from your votes, which is amazing. Um, so make sure to register. It's happening on the 19th and 20th of May. Uh, and it's going to be a great event. Uh, the first day is a single track uh, session. And then the next day we break off into multiple tracks uh, with a lot of talks between like high level visionary, polka dot in action. And then we also have a specific technical track. So something for everybody. So hope to see you there. Um, before we get started, I've also submitted some polls. Uh, you can see them just to the left of the chat box. Uh, so please take a moment, fill out the polls, just let us know a little bit of feedback of like, if you've been here before, what your experience with Substrate and what your experience with Polka Dot. This just helps us plan the event so we know who our audience are. Um, and then on to today's event, we have Sean Tabrizi, one of our core developers from Parity Technologies, who is going to be talking about fungible assets on Substrate. And then we have Bri Yin from Darwinia, uh, Darwinia CMO, uh, who's going to explain the path of a cross-chain mapped token. Uh, so two very exciting talks, uh, both of which will have a QA and a at the end. So if you have any questions while the talk is happening, please submit a question through the ask a question function just to the bottom of the screen uh, on the left again from the chat box. Uh, and we'll answer those at the end of each of the presentations. So I think that's all the housekeeping we have to go through now. Uh, so let's take it away with Sean. Sean, you ready to go? Yeah, let me just uh, present my screen. Great. So I'm presenting a little bit of spoiler, present, and everything should be loaded now. It's looking OK? OK. Um, OK, well, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Tabrizi. Um, and today, I'll be talking about um, substrate assets. Um, and yeah, I guess a quick warning is that I guess I've been known to talk uh, a little bit fast sometimes. I'm gonna try to keep myself slow. I don't actually, um, I think I have enough content. If I talk slowly, I'll use my time. So uh, I'll try to do that. But uh, anyone can ping and chat and say, hey, Sean, slow down or whatever. And I'll try to do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, let's talk about social assets, a multi-token world for a multi-chain future. Um, so yeah. Um, I guess first a little background on myself. Um, I've been working for Parity for about three years now. So I think maybe this background could just say like substrate, 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 substrate. But um, other than that, um, I guess before Parity, I was working at Microsoft. I was working on um, identity, um, identity um, uh, authentication, and then um, cloud infrastructure. Um, I got kind of interested in Ethereum and the DAP development world. This was kind of the initial like, um, ICO boom type stuff. I got really interested in that kind of stuff. And um, I was looking for a job um, in the blockchain space, looking to build next generation protocols. And of course, I was very lucky to have uh, stumbled upon uh, Substrate, Polkadot, and Parity. So um, it's been an exciting three years, and there's just a lot more to do. And it's, um, I think uh, I look back at uh, transitioning into the blockchain world as one of the, like, the best decisions I've ever made. So. If any of you here, I see that in the poll that some of you are kind of new to this ecosystem and maybe not so familiar, like definitely, you know, spend the time to go look at and um, kind of investigate all the stuff. It's really exciting technologies we're building here. Um, so yeah, so ultimately I'll be talking about um, assets today. But um, before we talk about assets, um, first we should go to what we may be all more familiar with, the balances palette. So um, if you've ever used a substrate chain, or if you're using Polkadot or Kusama or anything like that, um, you're definitely familiar with the balances palette. It's probably the most used substrate palette. Every single other palette within the substrate ecosystem most often has some kind of connection to the um, balances palette. The balances palette um, basically describes an underlying system uh, System token for your chain, so um, it is the like the underlying asset which you pay fees for, you pay deposits for, you can transfer. Like when you talk about you know the DOT token or the Kusama token on um, those networks, it's using the balances pallet. Um, the pallet does support this thing called instantiation, which allows you to create multiple instances of different tokens on your um, network. But fundamentally, it's really kind of a single token kind of um, pallet. Like the, the the main way it's used and kind of the main way that it tells a story is about creating a single token for your chain. 
And well, I think, uh, you know, a single token is kind of what you need to start any chain, like, you know, having this kind of fundamental um, system asset is kind of how you need to start any type of blockchain. But as you expand the ecosystem and want to, you know, allow, let's say, a more flourishing um, uh, user base with lots of tokens, you need to have another type of um, uh, kind of layer which supports multiple tokens um, and multiple assets on the same um, blockchain. And so then this is what the assets palette is. So the assets palette is something that actually has existed for a while within um, the, the substrate ecosystem, but um, it's it was not really, uh, I guess, designed to be production ready. It was kind of one of those things that was very simply made. Um, we put it out there, something fun that you can use. Um, and even other people who had similar needs as what the assets palette was delivering, which is this multi-token um, um, kind of a, a palette, they were building their own things. Because again, the asset palette wasn't ready. But more recently, we've actually gone and we've revamped the asset palette completely. And we've made it like what we consider to be a production ready, um, you should use it kind of app, um, a palette for your blockchain. And so really what you can think about the assets palette is it's the token factory. Basically, users can go and create new assets, which are very similar to deploying, deploying ERC-20 tokens on something like Ethereum. Now, um, the main difference is that the, the tokens are not represented um, with a smart contract. They're actually written and running within the native, you know, the, the runtime itself. And what this means is that um, compared to like tokens built on smart contracts and are individually deployed, that these are faster, um, it's lower fees to interact with these, um, these tokens, you get better scaling. Um, but the downside of having this kind of baked into the runtime is that it's generally less extensible and less customizable. And we'll um, get that into that um, a little bit sooner, a little bit later. But um, yeah, basically, I mean, the, the advantage of this assets palette is that, you know, we know that, that the ecosystem wants, you know, ERC-20 like tokens on a blockchain, multiple of them, and people can create them. Um, one of the things we've realized, obviously, from the Ethereum world is that while well, everyone is going and, you know, duplicating the exact same work, they're, they're copying this ERC-20, um, you know, contract code, they're redeploying it. We're always doing gas metering for each one of them, which is basically assuming like, oh, we have no idea what this contract's going to do or what this token's going to do. So we have to go and make sure that every single operation is metered, you know, on a, on a step-by-step -step basis, all that kind of stuff. And well, um, what we can provide with the assets palette is basically kind of like a, hey, that this is the standard that everyone likes and we just can provide it to you. And we can provide it to you at the core, like, um, you know, the runtime level, which allows um, us to skip a lot of the overhead and a lot of the um, problems that you might face when you're trying to deploy your own tokens. Okay. Um, so yeah, so then the, the, the key piece I want to share is that, you know, the, the assets palette is very similar, is almost one-to-one -one with the ERC-20 standard. So on the left, we have the ERC-20 standard, all the functions that are expected to be exposed. And on the right are all of the functionalities which we have in the assets palette. Now, it, the exact naming and the exact, you know, um, API is not quite the same. Again, you know, we're talking about substrate versus Ethereum here. But in terms of, you know, what you would expect to get from an ERC-20 token, you get all those same things. So, you know, we have um, room for metadata for you to, you know, name your asset to tell us how many decimal places there should be, what your asset symbol is going to be. Uh, we have storage information about the total supply, um, the individual balance of all the users and approvals. So we have, of course, the approval mechanism, which allows you to do um, transfers on behalf of another user. So like if you have a, um, like a, a DEX, for example, you can give DEX the access to your tokens that um, the DEX can go ahead and move your tokens on your behalf. And then we have extrinsics like transfer, of course, um, transfer approved, which is allowing this, um, you know, approval stuff to work. And of course, approve itself, which allows you to make an approval for another user to, to manage your, um, your token. So all of these um, exact same APIs are available. So um, that's great. And then beyond that, we actually built into the assets palette a bunch of ERC-20 extensions. So um, I guess the most, if you're familiar from the Ethereum world, um, I know when I when I was working a lot, I was working with Open Zeppelin contracts and Open Zeppelin had these kind of um, wrappers, which you basically, you can start with the, the core ERC-20 token, right? And then you can add to it things like a mintable ERC-20, um, you know, a, a burnable one, um, and, and Ad, a managed one or like an admin one. I forgot exactly the word, but it's like an owned one where you can go and, and do certain ownership things to it, a freezable one where you can stop the asset, all that kind of stuff. And we actually have these exact same functionalities baked into the assets palette directly. So you can go um, through the extension of the ERC kind of 20 API. We also provide ways for you to create and destroy assets, to mint and burn them, to make transfers that are even more optimal. So we have this transfer keep alive. This is the same kind of API we provide in the balances palette where, you know, um, when a user's account um, is destroyed, 
from transferring, let's say, all of their assets. This is actually a more heavy computation than just transferring an asset and keeping um, you know, the account alive. So this transfer keep alive is actually an optimal way that if you don't want to kill your account, you can actually make a transfer with a with a less fees. So that's really exciting. Um, you can do forced transfers from an, from an administrator. Um, you can freeze and thaw assets based on a user or a full asset level. You can transfer ownership and you can also set a team. And the team is basically the set of users or authorities that have the ability to do these kind of um, more high level ERC20 extension functions. So this is the common is that all the extensions are controlled by these asset roles and teams, which we'll go into next. Um, yeah, and it's very similar to this open Zeppelin idea. So um, you'll see a lot of the same kind of functionalities here. So let's jump right into the asset roles. So um, to get a better idea of how um, you can access all of these extensions and all these functionalities, I think you need to understand that you know within the assets palette, we have this assumption that there can be users or entities that have higher control over an asset. Um, I guess the, the thing to note is that each of these roles only apply to the asset they're assigned to. So it's, there's not one role for all the assets. Every time that you create an asset, you also define who the roles are going to be. Um, and uh, each asset it can be configured with their own users. And you can even, for example, um, uh, not configure a user for one of these assets or like, configure a dummy address that no one has access to, like the all zero address. And then basically you're saying that, okay, that role doesn't exist. Um, and we can talk about that um, as we go through the individual um, roles in the, in the assets palette. Okay, so the first role um, is an issuer. And this user is very simple. Um, this user can mint new tokens. Um, so I guess just go right back to the last idea. So like, imagine um, you wanted to have um, an asset where you can mint new tokens. Let's say you have like a, a collateralized backed um, stable coin. And as you collect more collateral, you can mint more stable coins. Well, having an, a, an issuer here may be a good way for you to be able to mint new tokens into your uh, palette. Yeah, a little bit slower. Okay, got it. Um, but the other idea um, it could be that, hey, you know, if you want to create a token that um, that is um, fixed supply, right, that doesn't have new tokens, well, you could basically go and set this uh, issuer um, as, a, as a null address, basically, right? And then at that point, you basically have a fixed supply token where um, no one can mint new assets. So just one idea of how you can you know, set these different roles for your asset, depending on your scenario. Um, OK, and then we have a freezer role. The freezer role um, has the ability to freeze an asset, which means that, you know, it, it's not, it's not um, uh, yeah, freeze an asset or freeze an individual. So it's not necessarily taking away a balance from a user, but it's basically a, stopping a user or an asset from being moved. So you can imagine um, if for whatever reason, there's some, some problem with some kind of, you know, external process or some kind of external token thing, you can freeze a whole asset, which would just basically stop transfers from happening, allowing you to kind of, you know, make sure that if there's any problems, let's say that someone found a vulnerability and took some tokens or something like that, that you can prevent those tokens from getting distributed crazily, right? By basically freezing the asset, halting the kind of halting the, the movement of those tokens and then figuring out what needs to happen. And of course, the freezer can, um, yeah, so, and then um, you can also do this on the entire asset level or for an individual level. So let's say there's some kind of problem with an individual user. Maybe um, if you're using the assets, um, the assets palette to um, kind of back your centrally controlled token, like you have a token that you kind of control centrally, but you just want to use the assets palette as the way to manage your, um, your asset. <clears throat> Give me a second. You can actually go ahead and um, freeze an individual. Maybe you're waiting for their KYC. Maybe you're waiting for some other type of verification, that kind of stuff, right? Okay, and then we have an ad, um, administrator. So the administrator can actually be the one who thaws the asset. So if the freezer goes ahead and freeze assets, the admin will go here and be able to thaw an asset. So whether it's the whole asset or an individual user, they can go ahead and um, enable the asset to be moved again. Um, they can also do things like force transfers. So um, if for whatever reason, you know, um, balances need to move from one account to another, let's say, for example, a user may have lost their balance and was able to prove ownership of their um, of their account. Maybe the admin can go ahead and force transfer the asset to uh, another account the user has control of, um, or other types of administrative tools, right? And of course, the admin can also burn assets. So if they, for whatever reason, they need to burn assets or destroy them, they have the ability to do that as well. Um, finally, there's an owner role, and this is the highest permission. So um, the owner role um, themselves can actually destroy the asset. So the asset itself is moving and, and being active, but um, only the owner themselves who created the asset can destroy the asset. Um, they can set the account for any of the other roles, so the owner can go ahead and update and manage the other roles. Um, and, uh, and basically, yeah, they, they, they have the highest level permission and control over the assets. 
So one of the things to mention is that, you know, that these individual roles all seem pretty powerful. And depending on what your token is, um, it may make sense to have, you know, you as an individual control these things, or maybe make sense for like governance or much larger entities to um, control these, these uh, roles. So mo probably most likely that these roles won't be controlled by individuals, but be controlled by some combination of multi-signatures and proxies and things that allow kind of a, a, a more, um, controlled representation over these assets. I mean, we expect that these assets will have, you know, significant value. We allow users to be able to, you know, bring significant value to um, substrate-based chains. And as a result, you know, if you do have these kinds of roles, you want to make sure that an individual user is not able to just, you know, destroy an asset or make new assets or burn assets, right? So um, you imagine that all of these things are going to be backed by, um, by, uh, by multi-signatures. Okay. So keep going. So um, one of the things I want to talk about, which is a little bit different from the ERC-20 spec, um, is this idea of minimum balance and sufficiency. So these are some of the issues that we've seen in Ethereum and Bitcoin and other types of blockchains that we are addressing here. And these are kinds of, if you're a developer or if you're trying to use the assets palette, something you'll need to consider when creating your palette um, or creating your asset. So um, uh, I guess uh, that's going back to, all the way to the balances palette. I mean, you might remember this thing called existential deposit. And existential deposit is basically a way to prevent this uh, state bloat from dust accounts. So dust accounts are accounts um, on, the, on the blockchain, which have such a little amount of um, the underlying cryptocurrency, um, so much so that it would actually cost more money to clean up these accounts than the amount that's in the account is worth, right? So you can imagine like a, a Bitcoin account has, you know, 0.001 cents of Bitcoin in it. Uh, and to make any type of Bitcoin transaction, it costs, you know, um, you know, I don't, I don't even know how much it costs now, but let's say a dollar for a Bitcoin um, transaction. So does, it, there's no economic sense for anyone to clean up these accounts. So these accounts basically stay in the state and um, they cause bloat. And this bloat actually has a real world impact on terms of the performance of the blockchain. So one of the things we did to solve this in the balances palette is we introduced this existential deposit, basically a minimum balance you need to have. And if you have less than that balance, we automatically clean up your account. Um, so we have the same thing in the assets palette. We basically assets, we allow them to have a minimum balance. Now this is configurable. You can have, um, an asset with a minimum balance of zero and it will act just like any other, um, you know, token where, you know, any balance will work. Um, but, um, we think that, you know, if you want to maintain the best performance of your asset, um, and for other things, like if we want to make your asset, something that is, um, self-sufficient, which is something I'll talk about next, um, that having a minimum balance kind of makes sense to make sure that, you know, you don't have these dust accounts in your, um, in your system. So again, built into the logic of the assets palette is this logic where if you set a minimum balance and the user goes below that balance, you, that, um, user's account will get cleaned up automatically. Um, and that the balance will, um, kind of be uh, swept away. Um, so talk about sufficiency. So another new concept we've added to the assets palette, which maybe is not normal for the ERC 20 world or the Ethereum world, um, is this idea of self-sufficient assets, which are basically assets, which, um, can be owned without needing to own anything else. So one of the issues with, um, with the Ethereum world is that if you want to own or use any type of um, ERC-20 token or any type of token on Ethereum, you, uh, you fundamentally need to use ETH. You need to have ETH to be able to do transactions, to be able to interact. And I think that there are some, um, uh, some uh, EIPs that have been introduced, which um, introduce some kind of like, you know, fee list, like no, non-Ethereum type transfers. But um, what we've done is basically built into the, um, into the assets palette itself, the ability for certain tokens, which are controlled by governance, to be deemed um, as self-sufficient. And basically, it, we allow that an account with, with um, enough of this asset um, can exist without needing to own any amount of the underlying system asset. So you could, for example, own um, Tether on Polkadot without needing to own any Polkadot itself, right? And this is a very powerful thing. I think I think that a lot of users wanted um, or would have loved to have had in the um, in the existing token ecosystem. And so we provided that here. Now again, um, you can't define your own asset as self sufficient. Obviously, that's a very easy way to just spam up the chain. But you know, if you can create a new asset, you um, show that it has significant value, and that you know owning this asset is provides you know some kind of significant um, deterrent to. Um, to like spam attacks or kind of bloat attacks, then governance on whatever chain is, you know, is holding your asset could go ahead and mark your asset as self-sufficient and then allow users to basically only need to own that asset to use it. Um, so why are we talking about assets at all? So I think assets are kind of an interesting topic to talk about right now. And why, why we've done all this work is because we're hoping to launch, you know, one of the first parachains on, um, 
all of the networks, Kusama, Polkadot, et cetera, this thing called statement. And so statement is going to be, um, you know, a proposal from parity technologies to be um, a common good parachain. And I think actually most likely the very first parachain that will exist on Kusama and Polkadot. And this parachain will have the assets palette. Its main functionality will have um, the assets palette. And it'll act as kind of like a central hub where other um, chains can go ahead and use the functionality of statement. And of course, all of the interoperability provided by Polkadot to be able to have kind of a single source of where tokens exist. I mean, obviously, I think that the DeFi space is booming and there's lots of um, parachains who are all um, uh, looking to create and um, emulate parts of the DeFi space in the Polkadot ecosystem, right? And so for them, you know, we can really optimize the ability for um, tracking assets that are in the Polkadot ecosystem by having this, you know, um, common good parachain, which um, is kind of the, the main source of all the assets. So you can imagine if I'm creating a DEX parachain, um, I don't need to keep track of all the assets myself. I can instead look at the statement parachain as a way of like the indexing all the different assets that are available, um, you know, the management of those assets there. And then just take advantage of those things and you know minimize the amount of redundancy or type of you know synchronous synchronicity I have to do with uh, my chain. Um, I think statement um, again for the short term is looking to have the assets palette as the main feature there, but I think hopefully we're looking to also introduce non fungible tokens too. Uh, we don't really have a NFT palette or an ERC twenty uh, seven two one um, uh, palette available on Substrate. I mean there are um, implementations of them which exist. I've created some in the past. I think there are some other users who have too. Um, but none of them that we've considered like fully uh, production ready at the same way we consider the assets palette. So I think you'll see that Parity them ourselves will be um, creating a NFT palette in the near future and then also bringing that to statement. Um, as mentioned, so statement won't itself have any um, type of governance inside of it. As a common good pair chain, it will be completely controlled by the governance of the relay chain. So um, if any type of changes were to happen to statement or even upgrades, um, let's say it's a connected to Polkadot, Polkadot Council or, or um, the Polkadot governance itself will be the ones to, um, in to initiate any type of upgrades or changes to the um, statement parachain. So it, the statement parachain itself will not have any type of governance. And of course, messages between the relay chain, statement, other parachains, all will happen through XCM, XCMP, which is what we're all um, working on. And we're using statement as kind of a um, the starting point for a lot of the sanity checks to make sure that XCM and XCMP is working correctly. Uh, let's keep going. Um, so some future plans just to share with everyone. So um, one of the things which is not there, but we're definitely looking to add in the very near future is the ability to pay fees with assets. So as I mentioned, uh, with the idea of a um, self-sufficient asset, you can own the asset by itself without needing any dot. Unfortunately, we're still at the point right now where you, if you wanted to move that asset around, except for you know if the administrator was moving it on your behalf, um, you would need to um, initiate transactions. We need to be paid with whatever kind of system token exists. Uh, but we actually are looking to introduce um, a basic oracle, which will you know describe the price um, you know uh, ratio between all the different tokens. And with that available, you know obviously compared to the system token, we would uh, could allow um, uh, transaction fees with whatever token exists. And then truly, you could have only some like tether, and you could pay for fees in tether. You could only own tether. You would not need to own any type of underlying um, um, asset of the of the pair chain. So that's something that we're looking to do in the near future. Um, Additionally, um, we, we've um, actually, with the assets palette, introduced a bunch of trace simplifications. So this is important for all the developers out there. So um, right now, if you're familiar with balances, um, and all the palettes are basically de dependent on this currency trait, which is provided by balances. And currency trait, in my opinion, um, I think the opinion of others also, is, is quite heavy. It, it has a lot of assumptions on what an asset or what a currency needs to provide. And the assets palette, you know, being a more simple kind of um, token, actually reduces the kinds of assumptions that are needed. So the assets with the assets palette um, in, um, changes, we've also introduced a bunch of new traits, which um, allow you to write palettes which have very simple requirements from the um, palettes which implement those traits. So uh, where, for example, in the currency um, trait, you would need to have an asset that can be minted and burned and force transferred and all that kind of stuff. Um, with the new assets traits, we actually allow you to create a palette where the only assumption about the token of that palette is that it can be transferred. And as long as it can be transferred, then it can be implemented by both the assets palette or the um, the, um, the balances palette or anything else. So we are going to be looking to backport a lot of these traits into our existing palettes, which will make them all compatible with um, the assets palette, which means that, hey, if you wanted to have a governance system or a society based not on your system token, but on an asset token, you could go ahead and configure that in your runtime. So that's a really cool, I think, feature. Um, 
Yeah, and so beyond frame, obviously we're talking about the kinds of work that we're doing at Parity and kind of built into frame, but you know, the important part of Substrate is that it's a completely open protocol and it's that everyone can go and develop their own palettes and provide their own thing. Um, just one example of, of, a, of a set of um, alternative token systems has been provided by the ORML, um, which is which is an open source team um, making you know making pallets in addition to frame, and there they actually have already in the past created these things um, like currencies, which is a multiple kind of a multi balances type pallet, um, tokens and X tokens, which are their versions of basically the, the assets pallet, and X tokens is a way for them to transfer these um, their tokens um, via XCM, and they even have an NFT pallet which is similar to an ERC twenty token, um, or sorry ERC seven two one token. Um, now, um, uh, I'm not actually 100% sure the, the audit level of these um, these things are how production ready they are, but my understanding is that a lot of the people who work on RML are from Akala, and Akala, obviously, I think are going to be introducing these pallets themselves into their system. So I think as much as you trust Akala to be able to provide you know high quality pallets, and I, I do do I do trust them to do that, um, you can go ahead and jump and use these. Now, we're going to... We'll look to implement our own stuff for our own needs for the needs of statement. I don't think that the ORML provides all the same um, requirements that we have, but definitely if you're interested in doing something like an NFT um, kind of parachain right now, you can go ahead and look at ORML to, um, to go ahead and use that. Um, and yeah, so I guess um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I'll take questions, but first I want to mention that we're hiring, and I really mean it. We're hiring. Like um, I am looking to hire people on my team. I think every single team at Parity is looking to hire more people. So this is the you know the best time I think right now. While there's still a lot of hype with you know all the things we've been launching, if you're looking for a job, you're interested in the blockchain space. I'm sure that there's a spot for you. Definitely look at the jobs we have available. And um, I know that there's even an opportunity here if another job listings quite fit you. Um, you can go ahead and message us and tell us what kind of jobs that you'd be interested in doing or kind of things you'd be thinking that would be um, helpful for parity. Um, we have um, an updates and events. So again, we, we talked about Polkadot Dakota coming up. I'm sure we have a lot more presentations coming up too. You'll hear about all those in the newsletter. So please go ahead and subscribe to that. And beyond that, um, I'll be able to take any questions for the next couple of minutes. Oh, and I have questions already in the queue. So I'll go ahead and do that. Yeah, so I can read the mic for you. Okay, sure, please. Uh, would change in roles, e.g. change in the address or key, slash key of admin require a government's proposal and votes? Uh, no. So if you are the owner of the token, uh, you can go ahead and manage those roles. So um, governance is going to be able to control the high-level statement runtime. But once you get into the assets palette, each asset is then controlled by the creator of that asset or whoever set up those roles. So um, if you own, if you created some asset on statement and you're the owner, you can, without the governance, manage it yourself. You are your own kind of governance of your token. And you can set your own team. You can go ahead and change that, all that kind of things. Um, so yeah, you, you, won't need to, you won't need any type of higher level governance to manage your token. Now, I imagine that maybe some tokens, like if they are um, you know, somehow like directly related to the um, relay chain, maybe those are, their, their ownership would be the governance itself. Obviously, governance would need to control it at that point, but that's, um, that's not a, a requirement for all the tokens. Great. Uh, can functions of asset pallets be called from other pallets like Burnin or Minton? Yes, absolutely. So one of the things I mentioned at the very end of the talk was that we, with the assets palette, we introduced a bunch of new traits. And these traits allow you to pick and choose the exact functionality of the assets palette that you would like to implement into your um, into your runtime. So you could, for example, have um, yes, um, a, the ability to mint or burn a specific asset or set of assets through another palette by using the appropriate traits. Um, I'll put make sure after this talk, um, when I um, when it moves on, I'll put a link into the chat, which um, kind of links you to where all those um, traits can be found. But if you you know peer into the assets code base, uh, you'll you'll see it there. Okay, are dust accounts more of a problem for stake growth SSD or operations performance on the try slash DB in bracket mm -hmm. CPU? Yeah, so it's it's both. It's kind of both. So. Um, Ultimately, as the as the um, dust accounts grow, your Merkle tree will grow as well, and that means that every kind of operation to an individual account um, will could potentially require more computation and more database access and reads. So, if you remember, I had a talk um, at one of the Sub Zero events where I talked about all about the um, the storage within the runtime, and basically, you know, the Merkle tree is a very heavy. Um, structure, which is great for light clients, but really poor for doing basic operations. Like to read data, you have to do multiple um, database reads to be able to navigate um, through the Merkle tree. And to do writes, you have to do multiple database writes and reads and hashes and all that kind of stuff, right? 
And so basically, the more dust accounts there exist, the bigger this Merkle tree is, which means that there's more reads and writes you'll have to do with doing every basic operation. And so being able to remove these dust accounts is a really um, good optimization for um, basically making your entire chain more performant in both database, um, like pure uh, hard drive stuff, and for um, the CPU type of computation. And then there's one more question. Are ERC20 tokens in smart contracts far more programmable for users while pallet assets are only programmable for runtime developers? Um, yes. Uh, I think that the ERC20 tokens, so basically the difference between um, the smart contracts and the palette is the fact that you, with the with the smart contract, you can go ahead and build whatever you want. So on top of the ERC20 standard, there's lots of different tokens out there with a ton of um, additional like logic, which makes their token unique. Like you can have even like, you know, I, I guess the most common example might be like tokens where you transfer them, they, they may initiate some other actions. Now, obviously our palette can't provide that kind of like, you know, raw sandbox functionality. Like you, you get the basic kind of core level ERC20 token with our palette. Um, now, of course, we are offering a smart contracts palette, and it's very likely that if you want to make more customized tokens, there will be standards in that world too. But um, those tokens kind of for fact will be less performant and less um, kind of optimized than the, um, the assets palette token because the assets palette is built into the runtime. So um, with the assets palette, basically you get what you get. Like we provided the assets palette that has these functionalities I described in this talk. And that is all that you kind of get. If you want something more extensible or with more features, you're going to have to either build your own palette, maybe build some kind of wrapper palette around the assets palette, um, you know, using the traits that I mentioned, or use the smart contract platforms like Inc um, to be able to write your own token standards. Um, but again, end of the day is what we're looking to do is provide for the 99% scenario who are just using tokens, um, the most optimal, um, efficient, you know, cheapest fee type situation for those users. Great. Then I believe that's all the questions we have. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Sean. It was yeah. a great talk. Yeah, if anyone has any more questions, um, you can ping me in the chat. I'll be looking for a while, um, or in riot or anything else like that. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to, uh, to share this with you. And again, I think you should look forward to seeing statements and playing with it. So, uh, definitely, uh, definitely keep your eyes out. Thank you. Awesome. Great. So up next, we have Bree from Darwinia. I'm just going to turn on her camera and mic. Uh, great. Thank you, Bree. So Bree's going to talk about the path of a cross-chain map token. So I'll let you take it away from here, Bree. OK, let me um, share my screen first. Um. Um, so, hi guys, um, this is Bree from Darwinia. Glad to present at today's Parity and Friends event. Thank you for having me today. Um, before walking you through the path of a cross-chain map token, I would like to give you a brief intro of Darwinia and share some of our latest tech updates. We also have got our tech lead, Arky, uh, today, and he will join us in the open question session. So Darwinia is a decentralized bridge chain built on substrate, providing the safest heterogeneous cross-chain solutions, connecting Polkadot, Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, and different blockchain ecosystems. Darwinia has been building on substrate since 2018 and hosted Polkadot China Tour, and Dr. Gavin came to China in person. Darwinia also uh, was one of the friends of Polkadot and substrate in the Polkadot light paper. Darwinia is also going for the Polkadot Perishing Auction, and our Canary Network Crab is going for the Kusama Perishing Auction. So for now, I'm going to share some of our latest tech updates. Darwinia has won a Perishing Auction on Rococo and successfully relayed the first Ethereum Robston block header to the Polkadot Rococo, marking the first step connecting Polkadot and Ethereum via Darwinia. 
And the first cross-gene transfer between the polka dot Rococo and Ethereum Robston has been successfully completed as well. Plus, Darwinia Virtual Machine is live on Crab. Crab is our canary network. So if you want to import dApps from Ethereum to Polkadot, just build on Crab. And if you want to join the Polkadot ecosystem, just build on Crab. Crab is featuring smart contract solution and low gas fee plus cross-chain interoperability. At the most fundamental level, cross-chain transfer of tokens, for example, like say 100 DAI from Ethereum to Darwinia, is actually the process of backing, um, actually lock 100 DAI on the original chain Ethereum, and Mint actually issue the same amount of 100 MAP DAI on a target chain Darwinia, empowered by the CBA cryptocurrency backed asset model. Beneath the surface, the oxtra of smart contract protocols, Relayers and Darwinia Relay, actually super light clients, play their parts to transfer tokens across heterogeneous blockchain networks. So today I'm gonna walk you through how ERC20 tokens make their way to the target heterogeneous chain Darwinia from Ethereum. Um, also, if you have got any question, feel free to come me in, just click the question, button on the bottom or raise your question in the chat. A user would like to transfer 100 DAI from Ethereum to Darwinia. So first he needs to send 100 DAI to the backing module, actually a backing contract deployed on Ethereum. 100 DAI will then get locked in the backing contract. Thus generates a cross-chain transaction and a transaction info would be included in, like, say, the block 100 on Ethereum. Before the issuing model, actually, the issuing contract issuing the mapped 100 die on Darwinia, the cross-chain transaction needs to be verified. Previously integrated by most custodial bridges, this verification process was done by wireless nodes or a multi-sig federation that is centralized or semi-centralized. But for Darwinia tech innovations, the verification process was done by a super light client, and we call it Darwinia Relay, which removes middlemen involved to be completely decentralized. A super light client of Ethereum was deployed on Darwinia. The verification logic of Darwinia Relay would be first verifying a block with cross chain transaction valid on Ethereum through verifying any block after it. Second, verifying the transaction was included in this block header. For example, block 100 on Ethereum includes a cross-chain transaction from Ethereum to Darwinia. We need to first verify if this block 100 is valid on Ethereum, and secondly, verify if the cross-chain transaction was included in block 100. To verify block 100 is valid, we just verify any block after 100, like say block 110 through optimistic verification game, integrating MMR, Merkle Mountain Range technology. So why verify blocks after, but not a block itself? Let's explain this later. A critical row called Relayer needs to feed cross-chain transaction info from Ethereum to Darwinia for verification. So step one, the first submission. Relayer will relay block 110 block header plus block 110 MMR root generated by a relayer to the Ethereum Superlight client on Darwinia. Block 110 header contains the block 110 receipt root. Receipt root is something really critical for the verification. So how do we prove the relayed what block 110 valid? This triggers an optimistic verification game. The relayer will be challenged by other honest relayers. All relayers will be required to submit historical block info, like say block header plus MMR roots of the block, like say 109 block header plus 109 MMR roots. So let's say block header info and MMR roots info would be critical in the verification process and 108 block header 
plus 108 mmr root, like say previous historical block info. For the verification of this block info, we actually verify if the block is included in the 110th MMR root. In this way, if an adversary tries to fold Darwinia chain relay, the Superlight client, he must prepare the whole chain, while each block must comply with a consensus rule. The tech difficulty equals detecting the regional blockchain network. So the attacker is destined to fail to submit historical block info. Also, economic incentives are offered to honest relayers for challenging. In this way, after several rounds of challenges, block 110 would be proved valid on Ethereum. In most cases, knowing the harsh cost of checking, relayers are usually honest. So we call it an optimistic verification game. Now we come to step three, the second submission. I remember last time relayers need to uh, submit the block header and MMR info to the light client. For this step, relayers then submit uh, block 100 header, receipt root proof, and MMR proof plus the transaction to the super light client on Ethereum. So now we come to the step three, calculate block 100 MMR root and verify. 100 and MMR proof undergoing some specific on-chain algorithm will generate block 100 MMR root. Then compare if block 100 MMR root equals to block 110 MMR root. If so, block 100 can be proved valid on this Ethereum chain. Block 110 has been verified by the optimistic verification game, so block 110 mm roots is valid. So let's get back to our tasks. We need to first verify block 100 is valid on Ethereum, and second, verify the cross-chain transaction was included in the block 100. For now, we have completed the first part of the verification process. Block 100 is valid on Ethereum. So for now, we have completed the first part of the verification process. We come to the step five, calculate block 100 receipt routes and verify. Transaction hash and receipt routes undergoing some specific on-chain algorithm will generate block 100 receipt route. Then we compare if block 100 receipt root equals to block 110 receipt root. So let's revert back to the last step. So last step, we uh, compare the MRMR root info uh, to verify block 100 is evaluating Ethereum. And now we have to prove the transaction is included in this block 100. So we compare the MMR receipt info. But if so, the cross-chain transaction was included in a block 100. And verification success. After a successful cross-chain transaction, Ethereum Superlight client um, Darwinia will send an issue request to the issuing model, actually an issuing contract, to issue 100 MapDI on Darwinia. Up to now, we have successfully cross-chain transferred 100 DAI from Ethereum to Darwinia. So map DAIs can circulate and use in DeFi projects on Darwinia. So next, I'm going to explain some questions mentioned. First, explain how to achieve verifying demand with MMR technology. So let's look at some questions just mentioned. The first question would be, so why we verify block 110 why not directly verify block 100 itself? So that's because empowered by the MMR technology with block 110 verified, a block between Genesis block to block 110 can be verified. Say if after uh, 100, block 105, 108, or even more blocks also include a cross-stream transaction, we don't need to repeat the verification game to verify the block itself. 
Plus, if in the last past rounds of challenges in the Block 110 verification game, Block 100A, Block 105 has been required to be submitted and pass the verification game. Verifying the validity of Block 108, Block 105 on Ethereum has been naturally completed. We just need to verify if the cross-chain transaction is included in the Block 108 header and Block 105 header. Also, why verify Block 110? So we just mentioned we can verify any block after the block with a cross-chain transaction. So why 110, but not further block like say uh, 200 block? Pretty easy to understand. You have to wait too long until block 200 uh, being produced, which is not efficient, right? So verifying block 110 is a balanced and efficient choice. So basically, we often verify a 10 plus block after block with the cross stream transaction. So finally, let's see the advantage of Darwinia Bridge Solution. So how does Darwinia has solved the cross stream transaction uh, and verification challenges compared to the classic super light client solution? So we basically improve the classic light client solution. So we call it super light uh, client solution. In general, with a Darwinia Relay, which is a super light client, we can verify the cross-chain transaction on demand through only submitting block header and MMR info of just several blocks, but not each and every of the whole block. Previously, classic light client approach each and every block needs to be relayed to the light client, and the verification would be easy, but severe storage waste and harsh gas fees makes it economically unfeasible. Darwinia Relay Super Light Client has solved this challenge. Another advantage of Darwinia Bridge is supporting the cross-chain transaction of NFTs. Um, most custodial bridge previously are relying on collaterals, so price feed is needed. But the pricing of NFTs is complicated, so custodial bridge won't support the cross-chain transfer of NFTs. Darwinia bridge removed the trust needed, so it supports the cross-chain transfer of NFTs. NFTs has been really heating up recently, and Darwinia bridge would serve as critical infrastructure for NFT. Finally, for users above these technical details, users basically trusting transfer their Darwinia assets like say ERC20 rings and ketones from Ethereum exchanges to Darwinia mainnet via our wormhole portal for staking. So uh, the trusting transaction would be like this. And we're going to waiting for Ethereum, Darwinia Chain Relay, and Darwinia Mingnet to confirm. Um, you guys may be wondering if this process will take so much time. According to my own experience and the community feedback, the whole cross-chain transaction process is relatively smooth and very efficient. For more cross-chain transfer tutorials and learn how to stake, make more staking profits, like say the APY information, please join our Darwinia community. Uh, for more technical updates, please follow us on Twitter and join our Telegram group. Now it would be the open question session. Uh, if you've got any technical questions, our tech lead, RK, would be happy to join us and we're going to answer your questions. Great, thanks, Bree. Um, should I join, invite Arky on screen? Hold on. Yeah. Am I here? Yeah. Oh, it's you're here. Okay, great. Yeah. I was thinking you were going to be separate. Great. Wonderful. Okay, so first question. What are the blockchains Darwinia is going to connect in the near future? Um, actually, Darwinia Mainnet has successfully, successfully launched last year. So the first bridge between Darwinia and Ethereum, bi-directional bridge, has successfully opened. Um, so next bridge, we're going to open um, Hacko Chain Bridge and Binance Smart Chain Bridge. Why? Because these two public chains have similar consensus model with Ethereum. So have got experience of the Ethereum bridge. It would be quite easy for us to develop these two bridges next. And we're also going to open continents on 
uh, in our cross-chain game evolution land on these two public chains. Yeah. Great. Um, and then a two-part question. One, which Wasm VM is used in Crab, Wasm Me, Wasm Time, or do you use your own? And two, do you plan to have the same VM in the mainnet or something else? Oh, uh, yeah. So we are currently focusing on um, Ethereum virtual machine compatible um, virtual machines. So we have launched our Dar Darwinia virtual machine on Crab Network. And we have got not invested in Wasm virtual machines for the time being. So it is possible to pay attention to Wasm virtual machine. And we are also going to partner with some Wasm virtual machine uh, platform in the future. Yeah, but our mainnet use, uses the same virtual machine here. Great. Um, and then finally, will Darwinia work with any substrate chain or just pirate chain? Uh, yeah, we're definitely working with all substrate ecosystem, not just parent chains. So why Darwinia is going for the Polkadot and Kusama parachain auction? We're trying to empower more substrate chains. They're, uh, like say, we know that uh, winning the parachain auction, the cost would be really high, but there are so many projects, substrate-based projects, they would like to enter into the Polkadot ecosystem. So they can simply build on Darwinia or build crap and use our bridges to get connected and interact with other parachain projects, even those uh, projects outside of Polkadot ecosystem. Yeah, and it is also going to expand our own parachain um, ecosystem, yeah. Wonderful. And then another question just came in, how is Darwinia going to support NFT? Um, so for, for the first point, Darwinia would serve as a critical infrastructure for NFTs. As I just mentioned in the presentation, Darwinia Bridge is actually the only bridge, decentralized bridge here in the market that supports the crossing transaction of NFTs. So it would serve as a critical infrastructure because Polkadot is still working on the NFT standard on its own. So um, basically at, at the beginning, it is kind of difficult to issue like NFTs um, in the Polkadot ecosystem, but but perfectly we have got a statement. Um, but Darwinia Bridge is still going to support the crossing uh, transaction uh, of NFTs. Yeah, uh, like say for supporting some NFT games like Evolution Land, because it's a crossing game, and users can move their uh, NFT mining uh, tours from uh, across different continents. And a second point would be supporting those. DeFi plus NFT projects on other public chain ecosystem to import from Ethereum to Polkadot. Yeah. Great. That's all the questions that we have. Thank you so much, Bree. This was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, CA. Thank you, Sean. And nice to get connected with you guys for today. And uh, don't forget to uh, join our Telegram channel and follow us on Twitter for more updates of Darwinia. Definitely. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. I hope you enjoyed this meetup. We'll have another one next month, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, in the meantime, remember to register for Polkadot Decoded. We're super excited about this event, and we hope to see you all there. Um, until then, have a great evening and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for having me today. Of course. Thank you so much, Bree.